Now then, Anne, come on Anne, let's give Anne a real <laughs> bit of welcome. Now then. Now Anne's very nervous. Okay, put that in your pocket. And she's going to tell her story exactly as it happened. The whole lot. Um, hello everybody. Um, I'd like to share with you some things that Jesus did in my life. A lot of it happened a long time ago, but until recently, I've never felt really free to share it with you. But they were wonderful things, and I feel the time is now ready. I was born in Gravesend, and I had a very ordinary childhood. But my father returned from the war, and we had an awful relationship. Maybe. We were both jealous of my mother, but we didn't get on at all. I was battered a lot as a child, and when I was seven, the psychologist who I was under discovered I was deaf, and I had problems at school, but basically I coped and I had a happy childhood with my sister. In my teens, the relationship got worse with my parents, and I left home when I was 16, and um, it was all teddy boys, teddy girls in them days, and it was a teddy girl, and a bit wild, but I enjoyed life. And when I was 19, I fell in love with a man, right, he was a lot older than me, and I really, really loved him. And we got engaged, I saw him every night, every weekend, we got flat up Woolwich, and some time later, I be we didn't live together, we just got this flat ready to move in, and, um, I told him I was pregnant and he told me then that he was married, still living with his wife and he had three children and I was completely frightened. My parents took me home on the condition I went away to have this trial and when it was born I would have it adopted and I promised my parents I would do this. But when my daughter was born and they gave it to me, I loved her, I couldn't part with her. And I wrote home and I told my parents, but they didn't want me home and from that moment they cut me out of their lives, the whole family, my sisters, my aunts, my grandparents, and I saw or heard nothing for about 10 years. I had 13 homes in the next 10 months moving pillar to post with my baby and social service stopped in and they were going to take her away. And I knew somebody who wanted to marry me, but I didn't love him. And I went to see him and told him that rather than lose my baby, give her up, I would marry him. But I was sorry I didn't love him. And he said to go ahead with the wedding. And we got married. I had nobody to look after the baby. And so I got married with her in one arm on my wedding ring, married with the other hand. And, um, we were homeless for a long time and I had two other children and it was a very violent marriage. I didn't find out too afterwards, but it was really violent. I was battered a lot there. And he eventually met up with another man, a friend. This man, I didn't like him from the beginning, he was very evil. And he belonged to a devil group down Hayston. And my husband became very involved with him. And one night, he came to my house late at night. And he had a large, long carving knife. And he threatened my husband with this carving knife. He put it in his throat. And he told me to get upstairs to the bedroom. And this was three weeks before my baby was due. 
and I thought I had no alternative. I tried to reason with him, but he wouldn't listen. I was upstairs with him for two hours. Afterwards, it was terrible, terrible with the feeling. I ran the bath with full bottom of disaffection, scrubbed and scrubbed myself, but I just couldn't get rid of this dirt, this filthy feeling. I argued with my husband, why didn't you help me? But he said he was afraid of the unborn child and my other children that were upstairs. I had the baby, but my health was going down. I had agoraphobia. I was sent to the doctor, but I couldn't tell him what had happened. I didn't want to go to the police at that point. I couldn't face the thought of another man examining me after what had happened. Anyway, we settled down to a sort of marriage. But when this trial was about four months old, this man came up again and he had a large quart bottle of cider and he completely smashed my home. My husband did try to defend me then and this man broke my husband's nose and he made my husband go upstairs to bed where the other children were and this broken bottle was placed in my baby's cabin cot and I had to spend about four hours with him and I thought I couldn't do anything. I was afraid for my child, but when it was over and he left the home, we called the police and I had to go to the police station, statements, examinations, and my husband had to give his statement and the man was taken in for questioning and we didn't hear anything, but about six weeks later, the police women came out to see us and they told me that they were very sorry that the director of prosecution felt that the police could not make a charge of this because my husband was in the home at the time and the defence would be knocked right down. And I was absolutely shocked. I just couldn't believe that. And I had this burning hatred towards the police. I felt dirty, soiled, and it was awful. I had no my parents, I couldn't turn to anybody at all. And because of this, the way the police could not charge him, I, well, I said to them at the time, but he can come here any time now. They said, no, don't be silly, of course he wouldn't. But for the next two years, this man came to my home and I just lived in a state of terror. I never knew when he would come and when he wouldn't. Sometimes there was a long gap, four or five months, where he was in a psychiatric hospital, receiving treatment for um, schizophrenia. Or sometimes he went away to this devil worship place in Hayston. But meantime, he came up to my home and I was raped again and again. And each time it just made me worse. I hated, hated the police, I hated men, I hated everybody. And my nerves started going to pieces. I couldn't go outside the house. I developed anorexia, I couldn't eat. And most days I used to get up, come downstairs and just curl up in a little ball, huddled in the armchair. And the winter we were so afraid of him. So once it was dark, just to shove the coal out the fire and take it upstairs into a back bedroom and hope that he wouldn't know that there was anyone in the house. And um, I tried to commit suicide several times. And once my eldest daughter really saved my life, I was unconscious in the gas oven, but I was at hospital in time. Um, during this period, they found out that my three children that I had at home then were all deaf and I just felt I couldn't cope with life, all my children being deaf. I couldn't go out because of the agoraphobia. I never knew when this man would come. I didn't know God. I didn't know nothing about Jesus. Um, at the end of just two years, I discovered I was pregnant and this was the last straw. No way could I think that I could have a trial to this man. But where I was at the end of my tether, I just didn't care what happened anymore. I fought back and screamed and he beat me. But when he left, 
I saw my psychiatrist the next day and I asked him to help me. I told him briefly and he arranged a taxi to take me to um, social services where they arranged for the police to come to question me. But because of what had happened the first time, I was re very reluctant to give a statement and it took about three hours of the police women trying to persuade me. But eventually, because this man had six children living at home, they said that they would have to take the six children away unless I spoke out. So I gave a statement and I was examined again, although it wasn't so bad this time because they could see what had been done to me. And a warrant was put out for his arrest and he was arrested very late that night and he was going into my house with a carving knife again when he was arrested and he was taken into the police station where he was put into a section into a psychiatric hospital and um, during, that was on a Friday night and during the weekend they questioned his wife and because of my statement it's come a right and because of my statement and all that had happened to her as well they were very worried about the children and they questioned the children in my home on the Monday afternoon and we found that two, two of the girls, nine, ten year old, both been raped with the same carbon knife. And so he was taken out of Stonehouse Hospital and brought back to Gravesend for questioning again. At Gravesend Police Station he gave a complete confession on all that he's done to me, his common law wife and his children. He was returned to the cell. But when they went to ask him about Chi, they found him hanging. He was dead, he died. I felt nothing, no emotion. I wasn't glad. I just didn't feel hardly anything. My mind was too down. And I met David. And my husband left. But although Tom was there, I was pregnant. There was a lot of talk of abortion, but abortion was new in them days, and I was, wasn't sure. So they suggested that I had to try the doctor, which I agreed to. But it was an awful pregnancy. I could describe all the times I laid in bed. I needed to hope it was a girl I was carrying, rather than to carry the son of a child breakers. But when the child was born, I, I felt nothing, there was no bonding, I couldn't love him. But we didn't talk of the doctor anymore, and he grew up with his brothers and sisters, he was quite happy little soul really. But I wanted to love him, I really tried, but he just felt like a cold dolly all the time. And my health was still very low. With David, I had reached a stage where I could go in a car. David drove me somewhere and waited outside in the car. But my anorexia improved very slowly. But I was still full of all these fears. And I was on 40 to 50 milligrams of um, Valium prescribed every day. In Gravesend, opposite Gravesend Baptist Church, is the social workers. And Unknown to me, some ladies in the Baptist Church wanted to visit underprivileged families and families at risk. And at that time, our family was a no hope family. We'd taken David's children in, and his wife didn't want them. And so, at that time in my life, I was with David. David was a criminal. I was a complete physical and mental wreck. I was age six, done five. And I had four of my children who were all deaf. I had three of David's children who were suffering from rejection and terribly emotionally deserved. And then I had Matthew and all the problems that was in front of Matthew. This Christian lady came to visit me over a course of months and she left Christian books behind because she knew I loved to read. And I used to read them and I was... I'm very unsure 
And I, I was very hard, my heart was very hard, and you think it's all right to her, so you don't know what life's about anyway. And um, one night she invited me to the Baptist church, and I went, but I felt nothing, I learned nothing, I just felt good because it was right opposite the police station, and I still had this awful hatred for the police, and I was very violent, they knew that, and I just felt good to walk out church opposite them. Not long after that, she invited me to a service, a healing ministry service, which she said a man called Trevor Duran was taken. It was two, two days of Trevor Duran on the Wednesday and Thursday, and two days of Peter Scudden, Friday, Saturday. And she told me about the healing, but I didn't really believe anything, but I agreed to go along with her. I asked David to come because of my problem with hearing. So we went together. On the way he asked me what I thought, what I expected. He said, I don't really know, probably half a dozen old ladies with the room with I don't know. But we went in this church and it was completely different. Everybody was happy, clapping, their faces were glow. And I just felt I stood out like a sore thumb. We sat down the front and I could lip read further. And for the first time in my life, I heard the gospel. I'd always thought that Jesus was a good fella. He died, then the rest of us poor fella, end of story. But I learned here that when Jesus said it was finished on the cross, it didn't mean it was finished for sight, it was accomplished. What he came to do was accomplished. And I was straining, I was trying to catch everything. I knew that the whole clue to how I was, to all my future was here, but I couldn't quite get it. They did um, healing ministry and people went forward, were prayed for and they fell down and that completely entire me. I said to David, I wonder how much they get paid to do that. I really thought, <laughs> I was really sceptical on it. Um, I went forward just to prove it was all faked and I stood in the queue and I clenched up. When it was my turn, Trevor asked me what was wrong with me and the first thing that came into my head was my hearing problem. So he said, close your eyes and I will pray for you. And I said, if I close my eyes, I can't lip read you. And he said, I'm not praying to you, I'm praying to the Lord. <laughs> so I closed my eyes. And I didn't hear a word of what he prayed, but I felt this tremendous power and warmth go through me, and I fell down. And I went to my seat, David said, well, I don't know. And the service carried on. At the very end of the service, Trevor picked up the chorus book and called out the last chorus, which was he lived. Christ Jesus lives today. He walked with me and talked with me along life's narrow way. At the very last line, he looked me straight in the eye and said, you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. And in that actual split second, the sky was come from my eyes. I realised that Jesus was alive and he lived in all these people. And I sat there for a few minutes and I, the gospel come back, all what Jesus had done, and I felt this love, I felt really loved. I wanted to be part of Jesus, part of these people. And I went forward and I gave my heart to the Lord. And it was the most wonderful thing that happened. That night, I completely forgot all about my hearing problem. It had gone, I was so taken up with Jesus being alive. And I went home that night and woke the children up and told the children. And the next morning, I wanted to um, tell a friend of mine who I knew was very, very loud. And so we got in the car and they could drive and we hadn't gone very far. And the pop shop came off the car. So David pushed the car around the bend and he said, um, do you want a taxi? He went. He said, do you want a cab? I'll phone a cab. And I said, well, what for? He said, well, right. Yeah, I walked. And it was the first time for seven years that I'd ever walked out in the open. And I felt free, free, really wonderful. Although walking up a hill, 
I became a little bit breathless and David started singing, give me all the my lamp, keep me burning. And we walked along together singing this and I walked all the way to this person's house and I told her about Jesus and that night she came to church and so within the 20, first 24 hours of being a Christian I left my first person to the Lord and that night David gave his heart to the Lord, my eldest daughter and David's eldest daughter. Then I spent the next five days or so really falling in love with Jesus, praising him, learning all about him in the Bible, but I still had my problem with my son. And after five days there was a knock at the door and it was a local vicar, Jim Fry, who arranged this convention. And he just came round to see how we were getting on, if we settled in a church and so forth. And I was doing housework and I made him a cup of tea and I didn't really talk to him very much. And him and David were talking. And as he went to leave my house, he paused and he asked me if, if I would like him to pray for me. And I thought he was going to pray for my hearing. So I said, oh, fine. And I sat down in his arm chair and he put his hands on my hand and I closed my eyes and I didn't hear a thing he said. And this part it was one of the most wonderful things that happened to me ever. And there was a series of pictures. It started where I was with David and it went back over the most awful rape parts that happened to me. I had the most awful beatings I had from my father, my first husband. There was the picture of my mother telling me that if she ever saw my baby, she would spit in its face. It was awful, awful thing. And it went right back to where, one picture, I was um, in her bed. I was a baby and I was trying to reach out to her and she was putting her back on me. And I had a sensation of coming round, although I didn't pass out. And Jim Fry was gone and I was crying. And the crying was from deep within my heart. It was really deep down. And I was crying and I was asking God to forgive all these people who'd hurt me. And I was forgiving them too at the same moment. It was a very deep, it was the Holy Spirit teaching me himself where I never hear sermons, so forth. It was a work that the Holy Spirit started within my heart and I asked David what had happened and he said that Jim prayed for me and Jim, asked, Jim told David that he'd had a word from God that I need, he, needed healing of a memory and that was what he prayed for. And at that moment my door opened and this cheeky little face poked round the corner with a mop of white blonde hair, grinning ear to ear. And this love, it just broke forth from right down in me for the three and a half years that Matthew had been alive and I'd never loved him. It was a whole three and a half years of love, the nine months I'd carried him, it all welled up inside me. And I remember saying, Matthew, Matthew, mummy loves you. And he ran, he put his arms around me, and I held him and I loved him, really loved him. And it was, it was great, it was a wonderful thing the Lord did. But within a week, I'd seen my mother and my father, and without any explanation or anything, I just felt this deep, real, true, strong love for my mum and for my dad. And a new relation started and they took us out. And I saw my grandmother before she died. And my former husband, there was no bad feelings, everything had gone. I felt completely free. It was really wonderful. And I was married to David a year later. The Holy Spirit took away all the hatred, all of the bad feelings, and even these bad feelings I had against the police, they completely went. And we met a wonderful policeman in church, and he was best man at our wedding. <laughs> and we were married on Saturday, and we was baptised on Sunday along with two of our daughters. And Arthur gave me away when I was married. 
the Holy Spirit carried on working within my soul and my family. There was eight children and so there was lots of bad times as well as good times but in all of them the Holy Spirit, Jesus was there. I had deliverance ministry where they cast out the spirit of fear and that left me completely once and for all free. David trained, the Lord began to work in him, he never went to prison anymore, he became honest and the Lord gave him a job that he'd always wanted, he'd always wanted to be a lorry driver for years and years but he had no licence and he used to borrow his friend's licence and work on that and he was caught and he was very frustrated and day after day he asked the Lord, I want to be a lorry driver, Lord, how, how? And he tried to borrow the money from the Baptist church. But I said to David, but maybe God just wouldn't want to be a lorry driver, perhaps he's got something else up his sleeve for you. He said, no, no, I wouldn't be a lorry driver. But that night he prayed, all right, Lord, if you have some other job for me so I can work and keep the family, I'm willing, I'll take it. And that Sunday in church, a lady came up to him and she said, David, the Lord spoke to me this way. I'm to write you out a track and you're to take your heavy goods license. David was very frightened. No, I'm at fire. He was afraid of taking the money. But the Holy Spirit taught us that God always completes what he sets out to do. And so David took his test and he passed and we never had any more problems with work maintaining the family. Children were all brought to know the Lord and most of them were baptised. Some of them grew up and went away but we know that they all belong to Jesus. Matthew, I prayed about Matthew and I realised that I had two choices. I could tell Matthew that he was the son of my first husband and this was an easy to buy, or I could be honest. And as I prayed, the Holy Spirit told me that he would let me know the right time and to be sensitive to him. And when Matthew was seven, he asked me, Mum, is Bob really my, my dad? Bob used to come to visit all the children from my first marriage at that time. And I just answered simply, no, Matthew, he's not your dad, I so oh, I didn't think so. And he said no more, and I gave him no more. When he was 12, he asked about his father again. He said, what happened to my real father? Where was he? And I told him his father had died. And he asked how, why. I said he committed suicide. And Matthew asked no more. But at 15, Matthew told her, and he wanted to know the whole story then. And we sat down and I told him all about his dad. And though with me his relationship was okay, spiritually I noticed a hardening in his spirit. All his life he'd been very, very close to Jesus. He really loved the Lord. He always prayed. All his problems were taken to Jesus. But it's from 15... Uh, he became harder and things got difficult at home and at 17 without any warning, no wow, anything he suddenly said, Mom, I'm leaving home it was hard really hard, I, I didn't know why but he went and I remember David was night work and I was alone in my house that night and I really cried to the Lord I hurt, Lord, I hurt and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and I asked God, let no root of bitterness take place within my heart. Lord, guard my heart against all this. And I gave the lot to God and we carried on life to Jerusalem. And a few months later I bumped into Matthew and he was very up and he gave me a hug. Hi mum. We said, let's forget all this, let's start ahead, go from now. But it would have been easy to say, okay, but it wasn't what I wanted. And I don't think it was what the Lord wanted. I said, no, Matthew, 
I want a real relationship, a deep, proper, open relationship like we used to have, like God gave us. I said, if it's going to be like this, I'm sorry, I don't want it. And left it at that. And a couple of weeks later, he wrote me a beautiful letter explaining all that had happened in his life, that he couldn't say it at the time he left home. And he asked me and David to forgive him. And he said he loved us both still. And it was great. And he came home shortly after that. But I was aware things were still not quite right between him and the Lord. And I prayed and prayed, and tried to uphold him through this spiritual battle. And he was listening to tapes and reading Christian books. And we came to King's early this year. And I could still say that he had terrible depression, which lasted for about two years. And I could say that it was a spiritual thing. And I sat down one night and had a talk with him that I believed it was coming from the past, from his father. There was some hold on him. And I asked him to see the elders, to have prayer, to have this cut through. And he saw Brian who prayed for him and banned the spirit and a week later after prayed for him. And then he came down on Thursday night, the young people. He returned home that night. And his head came round the door, the same as all them years ago, hey man. And I knew he was back with the Lord, right back with the Lord, and back with his family. And as from then, the Lord did big things to share. Peter, our step, my stepson, David's son, gave his heart to the Lord this year. Angela, David's daughter, came back to the Lord in a great way with a lot of healing this year. And still the Lord's working in our life as Adam, my oldest grandson, gave his heart to the Lord here about a week ago. And God, I found everything that I never had with my dad. He provided everything. He was always there. I could always talk to him. God's been a really wonderful father. And Jesus' healing has been... Oh, can it stand it? It's just been great. It's last. It was all many years ago and the healing has been fire and it's been for all my life and I just couldn't live my life without Jesus. Thank you. with that testimony and the devil is really wild <laughs> oh, man. the cheeky little face that kept coming round the door Matthew, come here Matthew here's Matthew